Hello and welcome to GB Talks. I'm Varun Bedino, Deputy Editor at Crowdfitness. Today I have with me George Kern, the CEO of Brightling. And I'm sure you don't need an introduction to either George or Brightling. George has been an instrumental force in changing the face of Brightling over the last four years since he took over. Uh, there's been a sort of a 180 degree turnaround of the brand right in terms of its marketing, its strategy, its product innovation, its brand ambassadors, and so forth and so on. Well, here to tell us more about that turnaround strategy and also what he plans to do next is George Kern himself. George Kern, welcome to GB Talks. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure. George, you joined Brightling in 2017. Um, You've undertaken a massive overhaul uh, of the brand. You've changed its products, its aesthetics, its marketing, its the, 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 the audience that it talks to. Um, give us a sense of the scale of that overhaul and what's coming up next as part of that program. Um, you're right. I think we made a couple of changes. Uh, and from the outside, it certainly looks major. But the reality is, I think we really stick to the roots, the DNA of the brand. Um, we, you, or many clients know Brightling uh, of the last 20 years with big, uh, in a way, also loud pilot watches. But the brand uh, is much more than that. And we looked a lot into the the history uh, of the brand, in particular, the 1940s, 50s, 60s, but also the 80s. And we found that Brightling has probably one of the richest and most fantastic back catalogs in the industry. And we wanted to bridge, in a way, the Brightling lovers uh, of the 40s, 50s, and 60s with the Brightling lovers of the recent past. So combining, in a way, also uh, beautiful traditional watches with with very modern uh, type of products. And this is why our design mantra is also modern retro. And this is what we stand for. And in the context of I would say, reworking the brand. Indeed, we reworked our advertising campaign, our boutique concept, et cetera, to make it more contemporary uh, and adapted and adjusted to uh, what uh, customers are looking for today. And I must say it works extremely well, in particular in the Middle East. COVID-19 hit us all. Um, In many ways, we're definitely not over it. Uh, But yet, Brightling is an independent brand. It does not have the backing of a huge conglomerate behind it. Um, you, of course, outlined your plans that you have and that you have been undertaking over the last four years. How significantly did COVID-19 impact the business and also the overall plans that you've just outlined? How, how Have they been set back in many ways? So you always have advantages and disadvantage, disadvantages when you're an independent company. The advantages are that you're extremely uh, quick, extremely flexible, that you have very low fixed costs uh, and therefore can react um, uh, basically overnight. Of course, we don't have the backing, the financial means um, and what have you of of big group, but in this crisis and when you look at all the reports, I think that in particular the independent brands did uh, uh, or, or, or had a very good performance over the last couple of weeks Uh, and months. Um, And I think that also um, the values in particular Brightling uh, engaged in before COVID, like inclusive luxury, what we call inclusive luxury, the way how we talk the customer with the customers, how we interact with them in a very relaxed way, casual luxury, casual luxury, luxury becomes more and more uh, casual and relaxed and you see it in our boutiques and sustainable luxury Uh, and look what we have been doing with packaging, with straps, et cetera. These three values helped us a lot also during COVID and will help us post COVID. Right. Um, And of course, uh, the 2021 novelties, Uh, there's Premier Heritage Collection, the Bentley, uh, and also the Super Chronomat. Uh, Which is your star performer thus far for 2021? so first of all, I think it is very important to continue to, to work. We never stopped uh, communicating. Even last year at the peak of the pandemic in April, we 
we uh, launched uh, one of our major products, the Chronomat, which uh, turned out to be a phenomenal success. It is very important in our digital times to be top of mind uh, with our customer, with our customers, to to continuously um, on regular basis come with newness, with excitement to talk about our industry, and it can be just one piece, one limited series. Uh, it doesn't have to be a full new launch of somebody, but you, you have to constantly stay in contact and bring that excitement uh, to the customer. So this year, indeed, we launched the Deus uh, Ex Machina, which is a, which perfectly fit, I, I would say, this current lifestyle and the, the wish and the, the need of you know, surfing, motorbiking, uh, you know, getting out of this this crisis. Then the um, South Sea collection, a beautiful color stone uh, ladies line collection on the Chronomat. Then, of course, the Premier Heritage, which um, we launched uh, three four weeks ago on uh, on uh, on April six, which uh, has has uh, has gotten an, a tremendous response. And now the Chrono the Super Chronomat. The beauty at Brightling is that we can. Uh, and that we have this, this credibility in launching, I would say, more traditional products like the Premier Heritage and very modern and super sport watches like the uh, the Super Chronomat, or I would say even female watches and more uh, retro watches like the Deus Ex Machina. A minute ago, when we were talking about COVID-19, you, you spoke about packaging, and that's interesting because that goes back to uh, the element of sustainability with writing. Uh, a few months ago, uh, you'll introduce the, the new packaging box made of 100% upcycled products. There's, of course, the well-known, outer-known uh, collaboration. All of these are great, but have you been able to measure the impact of these sustainability initiatives that they've had on Brightling thus far? Well, at the end of the day, you never know what elements have what impact in your sales. It's a, it's a package. We take so many, many uh, decisions and, and actions, uh, be it online, offline, at point of stay with a customer, et cetera. So you never know what has what impact. What I wanted to say uh, towards sustainability are, 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 the, are the following things. First of all, we, everybody, has the responsibility and the moral and ethical obligation to do the maximum she and he can do in his sphere of influence. And this is what Brightling wants to do and what myself I want to do. And of course, we're not Coca-Cola, we're not a multinational, multi-billion company, uh, and our influence is limited, but we have to do the maximum we can. So that's number one. The second thing is, which is as important, is customers expect our commitment towards environment. Millennials expect it, and whatever we do, is being well received. And we are selling luxury watches. We are not selling packaging. In, in that sense, having a sustainable packaging and upcycled packaging, as you rightly mentioned, perfectly makes sense. In particular, that we don't oblige a customer to take that packaging. He can still order the, the previous one or the, the, the more the, the traditional one, but the standard packaging is sustainable because we believe that this is something we have to do, as I said, in our sphere of influence. Let's talk about the Middle East. Uh, this is a market where we're seated at, at the moment. Um, give us a scale of your operations within the Middle East. Uh, talk to us about uh, the key markets you have here, UAE, of course, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman. Just give us a broad overview of, of Brighton's operations. Here. Absolutely. So um, the Middle East is today, in terms of turnover, um, probably the fourth or fifth biggest region for us, which is quite incredible. Uh, we have a couple of big countries and, and regions where we are doing historically extremely well, like the US, like uh, UK, like Japan, and obviously uh, China. But then uh, the Middle East is in, in fifth position. Uh, also for historical reasons, uh, all the officials have been wearing our watches, in particular the pilot's watches, since uh, decades. So there are strong rules, I would say, uh, in the Middle East. But we have been booming, literally booming, over the last uh, uh, 18 to 24 months, so even before COVID. Yes, we enjoy the fact that, uh, in particular, the UAE was not 
really closed and not really uh, in lockdown like many other regions in the world. But also everything I mentioned, the, the beauty of our products, the regeneration of our you know, marketing activities, uh, I would say that the very young and cool appeal of our brand was also extremely successful in the Middle East. So yes, the, we are doing extremely well in the UAE. We have just started to open new boutiques also in Saudi Arabia, in al Qobar, in Jeddah, in, in, in Riyadh. We just moved also in Kuwait to a new location, our boutique. And we have great partners uh, in all these regions, also in, in, in Bahrain, in Qatar, in Oman. Um, and, and, and we love, uh, we love that region uh, and we have been doing very well. In particular, I must say also with our new, newly launched ladies lines, um, which, which had a very good um, uh, acceptance in the market. UAE specifically, you started mentioning about that just now and about how in many ways it wasn't a lockdown or there wasn't a full lockdown, therefore operations could continue by and large um, as, as planned. Uh, but did the reduction in the number of tourists mean that now Brighton repurposed and sort of began to focus on resident and nationals? Uh, did, did, it, did it see a spike in a demand for certain collections within the UE? Could you talk to us about UE specifically, Dubai and Abu Dhabi? It's a, very, it's a very valid and important question because in many countries, UAE, Switzerland, France, uh, many uh, companies were dependent on the tourist business, in particular the tourist business from China, which obviously uh, came down to zero over the last uh, 12 months. Um, thank God, as I mentioned earlier, we have strong roots in the Middle East, where many officials uh, were wearing our watches. We have strong local routes, not only in the Middle East, we are local brands, we are local brand, not only in the Middle East, but also uh, in the US, in the UK, in, German, in Germany. Um, and we, our strategy is to become and to be, as we are in many other countries in the world, the ultimate or one of the two or three ultimate household brands uh, in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, in all the countries we've just uh, mentioned. We don't want to be dependent on the tourist business, it's a, it's a cherry on the cake. We'll take it if tourists are coming back. But fundamentally, our fundamental business is local business with local residents uh, in, in all these countries. And thank God we have these roots. And therefore, uh, it certainly was one of the key elements why we overcame this crisis so much better than most of our competitors. Right. Uh, George, are you open to discussing a, a, a broad business overview of Brightling, maybe the number of watches that are produced, yeah. average turnovers? And I think a couple of, uh, of, of, um, of figures. We, we, we make roughly 160, 170,000 watches. Um, there was a very, for those who are interested in, 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 in I would say, more uh, macro figures as a very good analysis uh, made by Morgan Stanley, which uh, was showing, which just came out a couple of weeks ago, which was showing the growth or the decrease of, uh, of, of the brands within the overall uh, watch market. And, and clearly we gained market share over the last years. We are now in the worldwide in the, in the, top, uh, in the top 10. In many countries, we're in the top three, in the top countries, which I mentioned uh, earlier, like the UK, Japan, uh, USA, uh, Germany, uh, also in the Middle East, we are part of the top five brands uh, in, in turnover. And, uh, but we're a little late in, in, in China. We just started the China business three years ago, four years ago when we joined the, the company. And here we need to catch up and triple, quadruple our turnovers to reach the levels or our fair share of business, I would say. But we definitely have um, strong ambitions um, we have been extremely resilient during the crisis, and it shows how strong and how strong the rebound can be as soon as the markets will fully reopen, hopefully in the next uh, two months. Right, and it's interesting you mentioned China because uh, I recollect from our previous introduction as well, that was a major focus for you. Uh, I know that you, know, you have big plans for that country. Has COVID-19 somehow temper down those plans for China or are they still on course? No, no, we are, we're still on course. The, 
you know, the problem with China is very simple. It's distribution. You, you don't have an established retail network like you might have, uh, you know, in the UAE, for instance, with Siddiqui running stores uh, for us in, 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 in Dubai or, uh, or in Abu Dhabi. What you have in, in China, because it's a very new market, I mean, we're talking about 10, 15 years of, of a market really booming and growing. Uh, there is no distribution. You need to open boutiques. And the difficulty of opening boutiques is the negotiations. It's finding the malls, finding the locations, signing the contracts, building the boutiques. And this is not something you, you, you do like this. It's a physical effort. Uh, and it's an effort which depends on opportunities. So therefore, um, we are gr strongly growing. We had a growth last year of 85, 90% in China. But as I said, from a, a basis which is too small and which uh, we need to increase. So this year we plan to open between 20 and 30 boutiques in China, which is major. I don't know if we can achieve this uh, because again, it's a question of opportunities. Where, there, where there's no offer in terms of boutiques, uh, there's no demand. So we need to open uh, distribution in China. Right, um, let's talk about sports sponsorships. Um, that's something that quite frankly, you excelled at when you were at IWC. Uh, now, of course, with Brightling, Brightling sponsored the uh, UAE Tour 2021 earlier this year. Um, give us an overview of sort of the strategy for sports sponsorships and whether that will go into, for example, Formula One or eSports or UFC for that matter, sort of the newer uh, the sports that are gaining prominence as of now. Uh, you know, we, we talking about inclusive luxury, what we decided three, or three years ago, four years ago, when we took over the companies to go another route. And, um, and we wanted to take a route which is different from the rest of the, of the watch industry. So um, we, we have the feeling that as a brand, we need to be approachable. So we need to sponsor and to be involved in sports or in activities which are approachable, where every consumer can identify with. Um, and which also in a way represents a certain lifestyle. Therefore, as the first luxury brand, we really went into surfing. You know, we, we, we have a surfer squad with Kelly Slater in particular. Uh, we went into triathlon um, with Jan Frodeno, Daniel Arif, um, Chris McCormack. Uh, we have a triathlon squad. We are sponsor of... Um, Kona, the World Championship, uh, Ironman World Championship on Hawaii. So we are going into fields which are not tennis, which are not Formula One, and which are not golf. Uh, again, because we want to be approachable. If you take triathlon, everybody is running or cycling or swimming. Uh, on the other side, you and me, we cannot just sit down in a Formula One car and drive away, right? So what does it mean for us to be inclusive and to be different and perhaps hopefully cooler, more relaxed, younger than, um, than what the others are doing. So yes, we, we, we have partnerships with individuals, sports individuals um, and, and, and sports, and we were looking into other opportunities, but certainly not the classic, uh, I would say, platforms uh, the others are using. Will, will eSports, for example, crop up on, on Brightling's radar? Uh, we have been talking. Um, I still think there is a lack of uh, awareness towards the sport, uh, power and penetration. Um, and, uh, and in a way, for the moment at least, I prefer dreams like surfing, being on the beach, playing guitar. You know, it's a, you need to associate a sponsorship also with a certain dream, and um, and uh, and and therefore we we love the idea because it's sustainable uh, of of e Formula One, but we have not yet made made the step in going into it. Right, um, and and you know, sticking with the technology aspect, uh, there was a, a, a recent collaboration with Crest. Uh, a mobile game. Uh, and Brightling, tell us about that and how that worked into Brightling strategy. Uh, today in our world, it's it's all about creating communities. Okay, the surfing com there's, there's a surfing community, a very strong community, 
you have a triathlon community, you have a cyclist community, you have a fashion community. It's it's all about we have uh, when we launched the endurance pro we went on Strava and and you have a sports community. It's today on um, in digital you need to find and address strong communities. And by the way, it's not about addressing the biggest community, but uh, um, the the a community any community which fits to your uh, to your brand and uh, you you reach them through digital tools so we test many things you know we we launch also the blockchain uh, in, in in the context of our digital transformation we had as i said that that uh, partnership with tava when we launched the endurance pro and when we launched our ladies lines we had another partnership with rest you know, because gaming becomes a key element, and with our, um, I would say, spotlight squad, this you know, with Misty Copeland, with Charlie Theron, uh, with Yao Chen, this fitted perfectly well in that segment. Even though I'm not a dressed uh, uh, user and, and player uh, at all, but um, it worked extremely well, I must say. And another very interesting uh, program that, that Brightling rolled out recently was the Brightling Select Watch subscription program. In, in many ways, sort of a try before you try before you buy program that came out in the US. Tell us about the thought process behind that, what the success has yeah. been, and whether it's going to come here to the Middle East. That's a very interesting uh, pilot project we are running in the US, as you as you rightly said. So the idea. Uh, and the misunderstanding is we are not addressing people who want a discount, right? We are not giving payment terms. Actually, the watch was that particular uh, individual who is using that tool will be more expensive uh, than if we would pay, pay it cash because you pay your monthly fees um, and, um, and then you buy the watch. Um, so the idea is in a way, to address people who are not sure about what they want. It's not about not having the money. It's about giving the choice of, uh, of three products uh, during 12 months and to take the time to try on these products, to use them and to feel comfortable with them. By the way, such offerings exist in the US with Porsche, you can have your three Porsche cars, uh, exist with Ralph Lauren. So it's not something which is new. Um, and what we have to do in our industry, which is a very traditional industry, is using all the um, digital tools uh, or means to address all kinds of consumer needs. We need to respond to consumer needs and uh, put together an offering which will respond to the consumer needs. And these consumer needs are going beyond going into a store and paying cash for watch and taking it at home. Does this also though give rise to the problem of, of, of a surplus of inventory because you have three watches, you might end up buying one, but there's two that, are, that goes back to the retailer. Um, you know, Rishma had that 500 million buybacks some time ago. There's always this problem with inventory. So how, how do you deal with that? No, in that particular project, uh, we have a pool of watches and all participants in that program are using the same pool of watches. So after a while, you buy your product and the product actually in that pool becomes a pre-owned product and is being sold as a pre-owned product to give still a price advantage to the consumer. So it's a, it's a, I would say it's a closed uh, um, circle whereby people are exchanging the watches. Of course, we take all the measurements, uh, in particular with COVID, in terms of cleaning, refurbishing the watch, etc., so that the watch is always looks uh, actually new. But in reality, it's a it's a pre-owned uh, it's a pre-owned watch. So that's this uh, ecosystem of that particular program. On the other side. Um, we indeed, we always try to help our retailers in, um, in, um, in taking back stock, um, in, uh, in refreshing their stock, 
in helping them to always have the newest of the newest in the Breitling collection. So we take back stock. We have roughly 10 factory outlets in the world, uh, in the US, uh, in Europe, uh, in Asia, where we then sell these, these uh, uh, watches as uh, um, as, as if you want a, a factory outlet uh, item with a discount roughly at 30%. But the most important thing is that we fight gray market, that retailers don't sell uh, these watches uh, to uh, gray market platforms and that we control the prices so that the value of the brand remains stable and is even increasing. I'm, I'm coming to the end, uh, just, just two or three more questions for you. Um, uh, the first one is uh, e-commerce. Um, obviously, this is something that has accelerated uh, across the board for, you know, for brands right across the board. What are your plans for e-commerce and, and how have they accelerated within these last couple of months? So, if you read the interviews of any managers in, uh, in, of managers in the watch industry and the luxury industry in general, they would all tell you, okay, e-com will represent between, I would say 10 and 20% of the business, depending if you're in hard goods and in, in soft goods, in more fashionable products, et cetera. Um, and I would agree with that. So of course, because of the uh, COVID situation, the, the share has been increasing, um, but, Digital transformation it doesn't mean only e-com. We invest roughly in our, from our media uh, budget, roughly 70% in online media uh, and only 30% in offline media to drive the consumer uh, to our site or to the sites of our uh, retailers to, to communicate with them um, and in order to help him to make uh, up his mind. So this is what we call the purchasing process which is very much digital but it doesn't mean that 70 percent of your customers uh, are actually buying online as i said i estimate it will be 10 to 20 percent uh, in in you know on midterm or short term meaning that you have many other tools like appointment tools to make an appointment in a boutique click and collect because customers still want to try on the product especially these hard good products where you have to um, set up the bracelet to your wrist, et cetera, et cetera. So I believe that we need to, to run this multi-channel strategy with our uh, colleagues, with our retailer partners, with the boutiques. And at the end of the day, the quality and the appearance of whatever we do has to be um, seamless, has to be... Uh, super professional because at the end of the day the consumer doesn't care uh, if he buys uh, from a retailer or from your from your own store or through e-com the service and the appearance uh, must be impeccable and it has to be at the brightling level so we are clearly multi-channel and the quality has to be impeccable in 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 all these um, these uh, channels if you want GPHG 2020, uh, Breitling won uh, two awards, uh, including the Diver Watch Prize, and it has been winning over the last couple of years as well. Um, how significant or much of a validation are these awards personally to you and at Breitling? Or are they, yes, they're important, but not that important to validate our work? What's your approach to them? I think it's a recognition of the industry, uh, of the professionals of the industry. Um, and we're proud about that. And I think the designers and manufacturing center, uh, everybody's proud about that. But ultimately, you're right. You have there also uh, multi-million dollar pieces which get prices and it, it would reach out to one customer. So ultimately, the real recognition only comes from the customer when you sell watches. So you know it's successful and it's well accepted. But being nominated, I think we've been... Uh, uh, the only brand uh, being nominated uh, or another brand being nominated in so many categories and then winning two prizes, I think is, 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 a, is, a, is a great sign of recognition toward the work of our colleagues, designers, technicians, uh, uh, colleagues working in the production. 
and um, I'm sure we will be nominated again this year with, with many with many products. But ultimately, I, I would like the consumers to buy our product. And, and, and finally, George, what can you tell us about what's coming up for Brightling that we don't know? Give us a sneak peek, a preview over the near to midterm. Listen, we, we, we are so active. Um, uh, and, and as I mentioned to you, every two or three months, there will be news on, on major news on, uh, on writing, be it in sponsorship, be it in, uh, through new ambassadors, uh, with, with uh, opening of new flagship boutiques, uh, and of course, launching new products. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's um, you know, it's like uh, watching a Netflix series. Uh, there's also always a new, um, there's always a new episode and uh, always a very striking new episode. Right, brilliant. George, thank you very much for giving us your time. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much to each one of you who have tuned into this episode of GD Talks. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And we look forward to having you once again with us on the next edition of GB Talks. Do remember to follow us on all our social media channels, including Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Thank you and goodbye.